Greetings from Alaska. This is Fred Roll, Curry Young Tribal Council member from Dillingham, Alaska. A um, little bit of an update. I went in last night to redo the interview with my cousin Nikolai. Uh, when I got there, part of it was me taking him to the hospital for his appointment, and we were going to do it after, but they ended up admitting him for pneumonia. So, uh, say a prayer for Nikolai. Uh, we're going to do a telephonic uh, later on this evening after all of his appointment stuff get and testing and all that stuff gets done. Um, he seems to be in good spirits, but uh, we'll see. So uh, either way, you'll be hearing his voice, whether it be telephonically or in person, uh, however it ends up working out. Um, now, uh, I was talking to a relative of mine um, last night on the phone, and he had, uh, we were talking about the Harry Man because I've been reaching out to as many people as I can just to get the First Nations perspective um, on their experiences. Because uh, like I said, w what I dealt with over my lifetime is not unique. It, it, it really isn't. And I'm sure for a lot of people, they're just like, gosh, this guy, you know, there's a whole lot going on in here. Well, the reality of it is, is that I, I have no need to embellish or make up anything. This stuff is going on, especially up on the Nuyakuk River. Um, there's, I, just just talking to, to Nikolai, um, unbeknownst to me, I, I brought up the hairy man to him. I've known him for, since we were knee high. I'm 46, we, since we were little kids. And on top of that, he's a relative. So when he called to tell me he was coming into town um, and wanted to meet up for uh, lunch or whatever, I, just out of the blue, I was like, hey, you got any good hairy man stories? And the first two he had to share was on the Nuyakuk. So there, there's, and and they weren't good, um, shots fired type thing. So anyway, he, he'll he'll explain that. The whole thing I'm getting at is a lot of us First Nations, we we go out, we're out there, we're, we're deep in the woods, we're we're hunter gatherers, you know, we're out berry picking, we're out subsistence hunting, we're out trapping, we're out doing all sorts of things. Always in remote Alaska, that's where we live. You know, we live remote. We It's not like uh, we're Sasquatch whisperers or anything like that. It's They're there. You know, that's... They're, they are there. It's not like we have to seek them out. So going to film this documentary is going to be different for me because we typically don't... We don't seek them out. Um, never... It was never even a thought until just recent history, past couple of years... Um, been thinking about getting out and doing that. So, what I wanted to share today was uh, a couple different examples um, of how things transpire usually, and it and it happens like like that. You, you're just out doing something. We don't leave the house every time we leave. We're not worried about the hairy man. It's just one of those things. Is like we don't worry about bear or moose or anything but you always stay prepared you know one way or another but it's not like oh gosh we can't go berry picking because of a hairy man we find out when we get there if if it doesn't want us around then guess what you just skedaddle once it starts shaking a tree or screaming at you um so <clears throat> where this happened was it wasn't up on the new yukuk it was just a, a random thing um there was a a hunter, a guide. I was a backup gunner for him, and I, I, won't, I won't name him, but we flew down to Nunavarchik, which is just outside of Togiak between Dillingham and actually it's between Cape Constantine and Togiak. So we could see Round Island just off the coast where all the walrus are. And so, sorry, you'll hear dogs snorting outside the door. I got three pit bulls, and when I start talking about the hairy man, my, my vibe changes so they get finicky and kind of like, Rrr. So anyway, so I'm a backup gunner for this bear hunt, right? And they have to, it's, we're going out in a Super Cub. So I went first trip with the pilot, guns, all, a bunch of gear. The hunter was coming on the next flight. And then the guide that I was working for would come on the last flight with some more provisions. And we're going to be there for seven days, give or take. So on Nunavarchik Beach, it, it's desolate. It's windswept and all that. But this valley cuts back 
and it, and it hooks back off to the right. And you, you can't see the whole valley from where you're sitting on the beach. And where we're at in Nunavartic Beach, it's like a half moon cove. You got Pinnacle Rock out on your right and always have sea lions out there. And God, the first morning I woke up, uh, I woke up to sea lion grunts that I thought was a freaking bear right outside our camp, you know. So very, very wild, pristine area. Um, it was in... It was a spring hunt, so everything was brown. Everything was still dead. Nothing had grown up through yet. So it was basically about this time of year. Um, I think it was... Uh, it, it was the end of April. I, I know that. Um, I forget when the bear hunt ended that year, the spring hunt. So anyway, getting them fresh out of the den before they have rubs. It, whoever's been hunting, they know what I'm talking about. So we get all our logistics done. Everyone's there. Me, the guide, and the hunter and I'm a backup gunner and I, I, I you know keep camp going whatever cook whatever it was lucrative so I, I didn't mind cooking I mean shit anyway I don't let pride get in the way of money but uh so we're sitting there and we're, we're discussing the hike back because you know we're talking gosh uh, a good five six miles which isn't bad but it's 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 up and down it, it's back up on these draws and then back up the mountain a little ways and back down these draws it, it is brutal so that that six mile straight stretch as a crow flies turns into a dozen when you got all the back and forth right so <coughs> as we're the first day what it was like our second day in because the first day it was just rainy and windy uh the morning we woke up after the day we got there so i was woken up to the sea lion grunts and all that stuff so i went down to the beach initially and it was all we were socked in with the weather so i knew it wasn't going to be a good hiking day so we sat around camp and we were discussing uh you know the game plan basically yeah we'll go up this draw we'll check here and and the guide had spots on dens and stuff like that so i'm just i'm just playing the background well the the hunter uh, he was from Colorado, and this guy, uh, just out of the blue, I'm just sitting there talking. The The guide was actually a white guy, uh, but he lived locally in the Bristol Bay area. The guy asked him, he goes, hey, you're native, aren't you? And the, the guide was like, no, I'm married to a native woman. Well, you know, what's this about? He goes, well, I wanted, I've been wanting to talk to a, a native person about Bigfoot. So that sparked my attention. I was like, well, what do you got? You know, tell me, you show me yours, I'll show you mine kind of thing. You know, tell me what you're, what you're working with. Well, he commences to tell me a story about the last time he went on a bear hunt in Alaska four years prior. And this guy, he was up in the Brooks Range area. He was inland grizzly. Um, he, had, he had drawn a tag or something like that. When I asked this guy, hey, uh, like, seriously... I take it serious because I'm first. I, I've dealt with this kind of stuff in the past. What makes you think it was a hairy man? He said it flipped his tent with him in it, and when he scrambled out, uh, he saw it grab the other tent in the group and was going to fling it when he yelled, and it kind of half flung it, waking up everyone else that was in that tent. So he he had had some previous experience with with the hairy man. But this was up in the Brooks Range, which is drastically different terrain than where we were at the time. At the time, we were coastal uh, down by Togiak. So he tells me about it, and I, I give him a few examples of what we dealt with in the area. You know, berry patch screaming, you know, just, just basic stuff. I didn't, you know, it's not in our culture to share everything. At least I wasn't going to at that time. So he starts talking about the last time he had come to that area where we were taking him eight years prior, something like that. He said he was screamed at back in one of those draws where we were getting ready to go the next day. So we're like, well, hey, we'll be ready for it. You know, we're not going to we're not going to not hunt for a potential. Maybe there might be a hairy man there, you know. Well, he commences telling me that. Uh, if he sees one, he wants to shoot it. He wants to bag it and bring it in. 
And I kind of laugh. I was like, yeah, okay. If that's what you want to do, we'll, you know, we'll pop it. And then we'll see if we can get it out of here without the feds taking it. You know, uh, if that's what you want to do. Well, he thought about it for a minute. He goes, well, what if it attacks us? I said, then we're all shooting the damn thing, you know. I, but, let's, you know, we're here to hunt bear. You know, let's not worry because if we're worried about the hairy man, we're not going to be looking for bear. We're, let's stay on, let's kind of stay on task. Because at that time, I had never been attacked by one of these things. They just scream, shook trees, throw rocks, th this type of stuff. Nothing. They've screamed at a close distance, but not not to where I felt life-threatened. It was shocking. You know, it shocked to the system, but I didn't feel like my life was threatened at all. Until certain things happened in 06. But anyway, so we get a game plan. The guy tells us, you know, we're gonna we're not gonna go across the right side of the valley. We're gonna hook around towards the left side of the valley, where we gotta cross a bunch of marsh to get over to the opposite side of the valley, and then start panning up, because his game plan was to spot across the valley from the left hand side of it and check all the draws as we go, because on the right hand side there was a bunch of draws that that cut up, and from experience we knew that the bears usually would work those draws for any you know, carrying any dead mountain sheep that may have fallen down in the crevasses or whatever. And so, which is a good game plan. <coughs> now, when I say it sucked ass to fucking hike back there, it sucked ass. I had on hip waders, and we were sinking in the marsh and the muskeg. It, it, was, it, it wasn't very well thought out, but we made it across. We found a path, uh, a game trail. It was kind of... Eh. Um, ended up losing uh, a guide stick. It I, it pushed through and I tripped forward and it went through the tundra. Anyway, it so we get across and we're hiking around and we get up on this little knoll, this little plateau, and we're glassing. And I notice out of the corner of my eye, way off in the distance, something moving kind of fast. And, and it just hit the valley floor coming off of a little bit of a hill. And it's moving from our left to right. And it, it's just a black dot. We don't have spot and scopes out or none of that shit at the time. And so I point out, hey, there's something, you know, look over there running. And they're they're looking just immediately down. I said, no, no, over there. You know, I got I got them to get, you know, their train of sight on where I was pointing. And there's just a black dot running. And that's all, all we could make out. They were scrambling to get the spots. Keep an eye on it. You know, we're going to get the scope out. We'll see what kind of... It looks like a black bear because it was a black dot at this point. This thing's just scurrying. <sighs> Gone. It hit the alder brush and all that kind of stuff and just disappeared. And so we knew the general area it was at. We're, we're up on a knoll looking down into a valley. So we have the high ground. We got good line of sight on the whole area because where we finally made it to, we saw where it rounded around to the right and where it kind of tapered off into a bowl back in the back side of the valley. And so, <laughs> you know, great spot for spotting whatever, right? So they're getting out spotting scopes, and they're asking what clump of brush, you know, what, what alders and willows was it in? And so I pointed it out, it was over there, and, you know, they're scoping, scoping, scoping. Well, I noticed a black dot almost straight out in front of us, same black dot. I was like, oh, there it is. Now, now, grant you, this is a valley. This thing went within two minutes. And these guys were scrambling to get the spot scopes out. I mean, they were moving. This thing had gone from one side all the way to the other side, which had to have been three miles, uh, or, or roughly, give or take three miles, in two minutes. Moving. And the direction it was going was back towards where we were camped on Nunavarchik Beach. So I point out, hey, it's moving, it's moving fast, you know, and they're, they're spotting on it, and they're like, that's not a bear. And the guy from Colorado starts hitting me, like, hey, hey, hey. And I was like, hey, quit fucking hitting me, dude, you know? Well, <laughs> he, he's he's panicking. He's like, that's a hairy man, that's a hairy, that's a hairy man you're talking about. I said, I, well, are you sure it's not a bear, you know, because sometimes a younger bear will get startled from a big boar, the boar chases it off, and it'll run for miles just to get the hell away from the big bear. Well, he he was, I, I didn't have a spotting scope. I was just using my naked eye, and it's basically a black dot moving. So it really didn't mean nothing to me. I, I assumed it was a bear. Well, this guy, he he gets a little butt hurt that I'm not just jumping right in on the hairy man. Not that I didn't believe him. It's just, you know, we're there for bear. I, my mind wasn't 
on on it like that. So he sits there and he starts telling me, we need to leave. We need to leave. And we're like, dude, you know, this guy paid a lot of money to be there. And now he's talking about we got to leave. Like, And I asked, what do you mean leave? He goes, uh, I was like, get back to camp? Like, dude, you, you realize how much work we did just to get here? And he, he got upset. He was like, I can't be here. I can't be here. I'm not going to have my tent flipped. I'm not going to have my tent flipped. We're, we're like, dude, no one's flipping your tent. It's a black dot. Calm down. We're okay. We're safe. We all three had... Uh, very high power rifles. I had a 338. Uh, the guide had a 4570 bush gun, and the hunter had some some outrageous. I think it was a 300 Ultra Mag. So uh, firepower was a plenty. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't worried about whatever it may have been. This guy was adamant. Um, he would not drop it. He, he stopped being quiet. He was almost dancing around like. He had already put his spot and scope away. He had all his stuff packed back up. And he was like, I, I, I can't be here. I can't be here. I'm not going to be flipped. So what had happened to him four years before in the Brooks Range, it, it traumatized this guy. He wanted no parts of even a potential run-in with, with the hairy man. So and it got to a certain point where the guide was like, hey, man. I'm not going to lose money because you're scared of something that hasn't happened. The guy said, F the money. I need to go. Let's get back to camp. Use the radio. Get me out of here. You guys can stay all you want. I got to go. And so, you know, the guy is like, oh, we'll have to put that in writing. I'm not going to get sued because you chose to get scared and leave. And then I have to be out all this money for logistics and all that, which, you know, I, I understood. So as as we're making our way back to camp. They didn't even properly spot this thing, come to find out. The guy just, he, he when he got the scope near on it and saw a black moving, he, he just kind of, it, it messed him up. So, <clears throat> the guy, when we get back to camp, because it was, it, I'm telling you, it, it was a brutal swamp. Just everything is mushy, you're falling through, it, it was just horrible. So... We get back to camp, and I'm talking to the guy down at the beach. We're down there smoking a cigarette because the guy was like, can you smoke away from me? I, I'm a non-smoker. You know, so it, hey, it's your money. So we're down on the beach talking, and we're not making fun of the guy. Okay, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. We're trying to understand why is he so freaked out because we lost sight of the black dot. We don't know where it went. So our camp was a two-by-four or two-by-two two constructed with clear visqueen over it so we could see if bears come around. It's basically just a little dry in. The little platform, it may even still be sitting there on Nunavartic Beach, just past the high tide mark and above the bluff. Um, but we're there, and we can see very clearly 360 degrees around us. It, it, the visqueen, we could even see Pinnacle Rock, and not in great detail, but we could we can make stuff out, right? So we smoke our cigarettes, we discuss, you know, he was like, I'm going to get on the radio and see about getting him a flight. And and by this time, by the time we got back to camp, it wasn't no one going to fucking fly in from Dillingham at that time of day. Hell no. It, no. Tomorrow morning, whatever. So he got it arranged. He was off on the radio and I'm talking to the guy, the hunter. I'm like, hey, bro, you know, this is a lot of money to just kick aside. Nothing's happened. We saw a black dot running. I understand your concerns. I'm not... I'm not trying to take away from that, but why not give it a few days? Let's let's wait till something actually happens. And so he he was like, "Yeah, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but you weren't flipped in a tent." I was like, "Okay, fair enough." And he goes, "Do you not believe me?" And I said, "No, I do believe you, a hundred percent, dude. Uh, you're lucky you, you got off like that. You're lucky that wasn't just a sack lunch. You didn't throw over his shoulder and fucking take off with you, you know." I'm not mocking you. I believe you. I'm just trying to get you to calm down and not throw away, you know, this lot of money. Just look it up on the internet. Guided brown bear hunt, you know. Eww. So, he's calming down a little bit. And I'm trying to reason with the guy. Even though I'm, he was so adamant that I was getting scared. Like, I was like, jeez, oh. You know, and I, at this point, 
I had nothing. Uh, it was all shake a tree. You see one here. Maybe there was one back behind you at the same time type stuff. It, it, there was never that close contact, that kind of uh, like what ended up happening in 06. But so after talking to him a little bit, he calmed down. And when the, the guide came back in and said, hey, we'll have a flight here. I have a small window in the morning to cancel this flight because if, if I don't cancel the flight by 11 a.m., he's going to be here by 2 o'clock and no refunds. And the guy looked at him. He goes, why ain't he here tonight? He goes, the guy, uh, he's not going to fly out this time of night because, it, you know, that's, that's uh, IFR and he's a VFR pilot. So, uh, instrument versus visual. Just a difference in bush pilots, whatever. <coughs> Their rating. So, the guy accepts it, and he goes, well, who's taking first watch? And I, <laughs> I laughed. I was like, we all have guns. We're all on watch. We got a clear visqueen tent here. We can't see perfectly, but we can see movement. If something's moving around us, we'll be all right. We're, we're in the middle of a plot of grass that goes 100 yards every direction, except in front of us where it's the beach line, where we have a small little drop. It's probably about a four-foot drop where the grass hangs over, where it's eroded along the beach, and then you got the gravel and the sand and all that, and it wraps around. And, of course, freaking loud-ass sea lions out in the water. So I reassure him, hey, I'll, I'll take first watch. I'll, you know, I'll stay up as long as I can, then I'll wake you up directly so you can have your own eyes on stuff, and I promise you I will, I will watch out. I'll even go and start a bonfire, and keep it going as best I can with the limited, you know, wood we had. Well, I scored and found some good driftwood uh, about a quarter mile down the beach. So I, I get this good bonfire going, and, and the guy starts drinking whiskey. Uh, I didn't know he had already started drinking whiskey when we first got back to camp. At first, I was like, why didn't you share? But anyway, so <laughs> unbeknownst to me, he's, he's getting liquored up in the tent while I'm doing all this bonfire shit. Well, the hunter, or the guide, comes out, and he goes, Hey, Fred, come here. And I go over, and he goes, Dude, do you got any marijuana? And I was like, No. You know, and he goes, The guy wants some pot. He's still he's still freaking out. And I was like, Well, I, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, there, it doesn't grow here. And so he goes, Okay, okay. Yeah, I just thought I would ask. And I was like, Well, yeah, okay. So he goes back. And I'm getting this fire going, and it, the fire ring that I made was just up from the bluff, um, kind of blocked by this little bit of a berm, like four-foot little bank or whatever, uh, to where it doesn't just blow embers back into the dry grass kind of thing. You know, it was it was in a little bit of a depression where I got it going. And so I, I'm basically sitting on a log with my back towards the tent and looking out in Nunavarchit Bay just admiring the natural beauty you know you got just sheer cliffs going up the side then you got pinnacle rock you know and then you got round island almost straight out from you where you can hear the walrus you know making their bellows in the distance it's just a beautiful scene and i'm just sitting there admiring that way back in the valley i hear this long droning moan type scream that ends in a very high yeah! kind of kind of pitch I was like shit I know exactly what that was before I could even stand up from that log the hunter was down on the beach ran past me as I'm standing up to turn he's already he's already leaping off the onto the beach out in the open he's got a gun he's freaking the fuck out I'm like dude Dude, put the gun down. You point that at me, I'm gonna fuck you up. Put the gun down, calm down, and and we'll we'll, we'll all take points and, and we'll make sure we're okay. Nothing came in on us. It was just that scream and the black dot. That's all that happened on this trip. But this guy, he was so. F and I get it. Uh, no, I get it. I'm not mocking the guy. Uh, if you happen to see this dude, uh, his name was Craig. Hey man, I'm not mocking you. I, I feel you, but you, you were you were out there in that moment, 
he, he really he, he I mean he he was you know hot muzzling me and and fucking the hunter and shit and plus he had been drinking now uh, some people when they get to a certain level of drinking you can't reason with them um, this guy fortunately wasn't at that point so I was able to talk him just calm down. And I started bullshitting him. I was like, hey, man, I, I, you know, I've, I've shot these things in the eye before and they drop dead. We're good. We'll, we'll be okay. I was fucking blowing smoke up his ass. He calms down and I said, what we'll do is we'll, we'll keep our backs to the beach. I'll move this log to this side of the fire and we'll keep, we'll keep an eye out. So what I mean by that is we kept the fire kind of quasi beside us because you wanted to keep your, your night vision. And uh, so he agrees, and we sit down on this log. Now, uh, I had him take the round out of the chamber. I showed him, hey, you've been drinking. I haven't. I have a round in the chamber. I'll have time to fire, and you can chamber around and, and back me up if something happens, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's a good idea. And he's kind of... He's kind of getting to this point of drunk, like, hey, I'm not going to be thrown. I'm not going to be thrown in the tent again. And and the guide has had it. Like, he's like, you know what, man? It, we understand. You're freaked out. Calm down. You're leaving tomorrow. He goes, even if you get up in the fucking morning and you change your mind, dude, you're leaving tomorrow. You're gone. No refunds. We were here to do this. And this is unacceptable. And rightfully so. You, you know, the guy is messing with his money. Even though he, I, I think he gave him a half partial return or something. Just because he's a good guy. But uh, he was pissed in the moment. And so I literally sat there nodding off every once in a while. Listening to this guy. Uh, it wouldn't even share his whiskey, asshole. So he, he's sitting there and, and he's not drowning in sorrows. But he's like, he's self-medicating is what this guy is doing. Uh, so what had happened to him four years prior on up in the Brooks range really affected him hard, like really hard. And so, you know, uh, things like that happen to people and a lot of them don't share it because, um, at the time I kind of ridiculed them a little bit myself, even though I seen them, you know, I know they're, I know they're out there. So I kind of. Looking back on that, I kind of feel bad because me doing that and, and, and the hunter doing that may uh, it may have caused him to never like share that openly and get it off his chest because obviously he was traumatized enough four years later to to start hitting the bottle really hard just at the thought of it. So just just something to think about. There's there's people that that have these things happen. And in certain areas, I know there's there's places down in lower 48. Uh, uh, Buddy Scott sent me some photos, and, and they appear to be pretty thick down there, too. Um, thankfully, they're not aggressive like up here. Uh, something that I wanted to say as well is the, these things are not unique to me. So if, if you hear these experiences and these encounters, be like, man, there's no way... Wait till you hear others. I got I got other people that are going to be sharing their experiences, and it's eye opening. We we have so many encounters, uh, First Nations that we don't share. We just don't. Every once in a while, you hear a couple people from Alaska on other channels, but it, as a majority, you don't hear it on a, enough of a basis. And that that's another reason for this channel is to get uh, my fellow Alaskans or First Nations to share. You don't have to leave your name or any of that crap. You can remain anonymous. It's it's not a big deal. Just just share the experience and where it happened. And the nature of the experience. Aggressive, curious, just saw it in the distance, running by, whatever it may be. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be uh, an experience where it's a holy shit moment. Just seeing one of these things is a holy shit moment. That That's, that's enough. You know what I mean? Because even though when I was little and I knew, I, I seen them at a distance, but until they started throwing rocks at the boat in 1983, they weren't real. Like, it, they were real, but they there was no no context to it, so to speak. And so, 
I, I just want to encourage those who have had any experiences. I, I got a backlog of, of people that have shared. Um, I, I'm trying to work some of that into the documentary because some of uh, a good portion of them are First Nations, and so I want uh, the documentary I'm doing is the the first parts of it are going to be strictly First Nations from Alaska perspective, and then it's going to expand from there. And it's nothing against anyone else. It's just there's a huge lack of like through and through First Nations type documentary on the Harry Man. Um, it's it's a a large unspoken part of our culture you can have an encounter with your cousin when you get back to the village guess what you ain't talking about it look at those guys in Kalaganik it happens all the time they don't talk about it New Stuyahawk happens all the time they don't talk about it they get they get back and it's daily life it's daily life and it's accepted there's no there's no guessing you know I Last time I was in Kalaganik, an elder told me to pick up a gun. You need to be armed. You know? Uh, anyway, uh, some of these things may seem outlandish. and may seem, geez, you know, uh, you know, and what's going on with this guy, you know? Gosh, is, is he making something up? No, I don't have to. As a matter of fact, some of the stuff I don't even share because it sounds so crazy. And, and I get that, you know. Um, hopefully I can at least get uh, Nikolai telephonically. I, I prefer, I had him, I have him recorded, but he didn't, I, when he proofed it, he didn't like how he looked on it or whatever. So I was like, okay, no worry. Everyone gets gray hair because it's no big deal. But anyway, so we'll, we'll get it audio at least you know but I, I want people to share in their own voice whenever possible I, I just don't want to be the mouthpiece for everyone I want them to speak for themselves you know and uh, anyone seeking these things careful what you wish for um, like I, I know of three places that I could probably go right now if I had the resources to get there and within 48 hours, some some scary, hairy shit's going to happen. Um, and, and I say that with confidence because of the times I've been there and hearing from others that have been there, same shit. Same shit. Right after dark, they come in, they circle, they sniff, they try to break in. Like, okay, let me give you an example. New Cuck River. On the Nuyakuk River, when it branches off from the Nushigak River, they have salmon counting towers. And at one of these towers is where I had my experience in 06, but we were up by Nuyakuk Falls. So the first salmon counting tower that's on the Nuyakuk is like a bunkhouse style. It's, it's much bigger than the one we were at. There's a shed there, an actual shed, where they would keep generators, you know, sonar, LIDAR equipment for the, the counting tower, that type of shit, right? Well, that particular one people use quite often um, because it's just just a not even a quarter mile up to the, the Nuyakuk off where it branches from the Nushigak. And that's just south of Harris Creek on the Nushigak. So <coughs> this group of guys, I, I know them all very well, grew up with them. They, this happened three years ago, okay? They were up at that that particular salmon counting tower, and when they got there, the bunkhouse, someone was already camped out in it, a group of moose hunters, uh, trophy moose up there. So, and that's typically as far as most hunters go up to Nuyakuk. I, I, I don't, I don't know of any, at least locals. I don't, and I don't even know of any outfits that take people up there. I know now there's a Nuyakuk River Fishing Lodge, but that's like flying shit. Anyway, so they get up there, and they can't sleep in the main bunk area because it's, it's full of like five, six people or whatever, and, and they, there was three of them, four of them in their party. So this little shack that they went and sat in, uh, it, it had a three-hinge door, and it, it wasn't chintzy, but it, it was basically strong enough for snow load, and that was about it, you know? And so as they're in there, 
they were just starting to doze off, but they kept the firearms because they saw a lot of bear sign when they got there, right? So they had their firearms near them, loaded, you know, safety's on, of course, because they're not ignorant guys. Well, halfway through the night, they get woken up from the guys in the bunk that, that where they couldn't stay, right? So they get woken up. The guys are like, hey, we're heading out. We're not... We're not effing staying in this damn place. Screw this place, right? They didn't. They're just, you know, like, okay. So what you... And when they woke them up, they had already packed all their shit out of that little bunkhouse and and got it in their skiff, and they drifted away. It was still dark out, you know? These guys, they, they got out of there. So they're like, hey, let's not sleep in the damn shed. There's bunks in there. Let's go. So as they were gathering up their their packs and their guns and stuff to go into the, the main uh, little counting tower, the, the counting tower shack or whatever. Uh, the the second skiff that was part of that group was just getting ready to leave, and one of the guys said, make sure you lock that door. And that's all they said. And and they drift away. They're spotlighting. They're looking for rocks and stuff because the Nui Cucks is a shallow river. you got to know the channel. Anyway, so they move all their stuff middle of the night over into the other bunk they they light a lantern in the back bunking area which is roughly twice the size of the one i was in and so they're all on these bunks now there's a door that separates the bunk part from the the kitchen living area just on adjacent to it you know it's all attached but there's an inner doorway and the outer door they didn't lock it right so they're sitting there and the door to the bunk area where they're at is just slightly ajar. Just slightly. So, as they're sitting there talking, the lantern's in the back of the room. So, their shadows are cast towards this doorway, right? But they're talking. There's there's two on the bunk across from one guy. And this guy that this particular... Well, it happened to all of them. I'll get to it. So, there's one guy on the lower bunk and two on the other one. And yeah, it was just three of them. I apologize if I said four, but no, there was just three of them. And so the guy on the top bunk on the opposite side kept hearing something. He goes, did you did you lock that door? It sounded like someone stepped in. He was like, for what? You know, bears can't open doors. They weren't they weren't thinking about the hairy man. So as time goes on, they're they're discussing because now they're wide awake. They had dozed off a little bit and were woken up to the guys leaving, right? They hear the outside door kunk, kunk. Something was something was messing with the door. And like, I wonder if they forgot something. So the guy on the lower bunk grabs a flashlight, swings open the door, turns on the light, because there was no light out in the uh in the area between the bunk area and the outside door. Uh, it was dark. So he beams a light and the door's wide open. He walks over and he shuts it. He didn't lock it. He just shut it. What you know, wasn't gonna fiddle with it, wasn't really worried about it, just didn't want the door banging, right? So he shuts it. He walks back in and sits down. And as soon as he sits down and he kinda quasi shuts the door and leaves a little bit of a gap so he can see out from where his position is on the bunk. That outside door opens again, and they hear three steps. Put-thump, put-thump, put-thump. Now, it's a, it's like a good 15-foot distance between that outer door and that inner door to the bunk area. And this thing took three steps. This hairy man pushes the door open, has his hand on top of the door, and leans in and leans his head up because the threshold of the door was behind his neck at this point. And it looks at all of them and looks down at the guy on the lower bunk and then looks at the one on the bigger bunk and smiled at him. And dude on the upper bunk, they were all in shock, but he he had to, you know, he was present enough to grab the rifle and click the safety. And when he clicked the safety, this thing disappeared very quickly. But as it was going out the door, it tried to grab the guy that was on the lower bunk that had just shut that outside door. Grabbed a hold of his jacket and tore part of his uh, his goose down jacket off of him. And he pushed the door to keep himself in the room as this thing ripped the jacket off of him. And they heard it run off. 
those types of things happen on the Nuyakuk River. Um, it is a, a no joke place. Um, I'm not just saying that facetiously. I'm not just trying to, you know, oh, I know a spot. No, that's that's a spot where they will come to you. If you're in one of those counting tower shacks, it's just a matter of time before one or more is there. That's just that's just a fact. Um, logistically, getting there is a serious bitch, though, because it's way upriver, flying's expensive. It float planes can't land in that particular part because it's too shallow. You know, you got all this weight from a plane coming trying to <laughs> land on pontoons. There's it, it's not deep enough to not bottom out. You know, so the majority of people will fly into it up river further where there's deeper channels, or they boat. So just it, it's happening uh, far more regularly than people realize because no one talks about it. If you've been to Alaska or live in Alaska and have had an experience, uh, feel free to share Alaskan Harry Man Project at gmail dot com or no comp nine zero seven at gmail dot com. Uh, share with us. Uh, the map that I'm having made is in process. Uh, there's a bunch of pins already set in it. I think I will put it on the, the Facebook page or find a way to have it um, up at every video or on every video. Or, or I'll figure out something. Uh, maybe a place people can just go and check. Oh, there was a sighting here, that type of thing. So that being said... Uh, We'll talk to you all later, and hopefully I'll have uh, Nikolai Chris here either on the phone or at least next to me, and we can he can share his experiences uh, from the Nuyakuk and everywhere else he's had one. All right, thanks for listening.